So I've been a photographer now for 20 years, and the majority of that time has been spent photographing humans. But I was getting to a point where my work was becoming slightly disposable in the digital age. I kind of wanted to produce images that had a sense of worth again. I, was, I needed a new route. And one day, my boy, Sebastian, brought in a beetle from the back garden. Now, it was a common species to the naked eye, but we decided to look at it under his microscope. And this is what we saw. Now, when I first viewed this image, this is the back of that creature, I couldn't believe how beautiful it was. And so I decided to photograph it for him as a present. But at the same time, I set myself a challenge. And that was, could I take all my knowledge and skill of photographic lighting and translate that onto a subject that was just six millimeters long? But more importantly, could I keep creative control over that light at the same time? And so for the next six months, I researched various macro techniques and microscopy. And I built a system that helped me produce this image here. This is that beetle that my boy brought in from the garden. And from this point onwards, I've been completely and utterly obsessed with photographing the microscopic world. You know, it's allowed me to appreciate my environment in an entirely new way. And I'm starting to understand these tiny creatures that we share the planet with. But most importantly, I'm realizing that if you look that a little bit closer, you know, things aren't always what they seem. So my process continued to evolve for some time until I needed better models. And so I approached the Oxford University Museum of Natural History, and they kindly gave me access to their collection of seven million specimens. And over the next three years, I photographed just 34 of them to produce an exhibition called Microsculpture. Now, this has been traveling for two years now, and it's gone through the Middle East, Europe, and the US. And people seem amazed by these shots. They haven't seen insects like this before, particularly the children. You know, all they actually want to do is touch these big bugs. But if you can't get to a show, you can go to the website, microsculpture.net, and there you can zoom all the way in to the full high-resolution files. It's good fun, I promise you. Now, these are high-magnification photographs. I'd like to take you just a little bit closer, if that's OK. So this first one here, this is a dual longhorn beetle, and it comes from uh, Nigeria. And when you take a little closer look, you know, you, it's covered in this beautiful layer of fur. Now, these colors, by the way, in all the images, they're authentic. Nothing is manipulated or enhanced. Here, we've got a stunning iridescent bark mantis. This comes from Malaysia, this creature. And they are ferocious predators. Now, they've got these big, bulbous eyes, and they've got strong legs. And on the front, these two raptoral appendages that they strike their prey with at lightning speed. But obviously, we all like spiders, don't we? So we had to have one. This is from a recent collaboration with the National Museum of Qatar. And if we go one step further, you can see this beautiful head. Are you with me? No. <laughs> Let's go a little bit closer, then. And here you've got those eyes. Now, even though spiders have multiple eyes, they generally actually have quite poor eyesight. They rely more on their sense of touch and vibration to locate their prey. I promise that is the last and only spider in this talk. Now, again, from Qatar, this bee um, is probably only 17, maybe 16 millimeters in real life. And, but what I really love about this picture is when you zoom into the wing. Yeah, you've got these tiny little dots, and these are hairs, and they detect wind pattern in flight. But I want to show you this. This is one of my favorite animals or creatures I've ever photographed. And I'm referring to the little black dot in the box, not my cat. That dot is a shield bug. And it was collected by Charles Darwin in 1856. And he brought it back from Australia to England on the HMS Beagle. And then somehow, 160 years later, it found its way into my studio to have its portrait taken. I find that quite surreal. I really do. Now, each of these images are created from between 8 and 10,000 separate shots. I use microscope lenses, and they take about three weeks each to create. Now, one of the challenges of photography at high magnification is the inherent shallow depth of field. And by this, I mean the pictures, the images only have a tiny slither of focus. 
And so the way I get around this is that I place the camera on a rail that I program to move forward eight microns in between each picture. Now, that's about one-seventh the width of a human hair. That provides me with a huge stack of images, each with a tiny slither of focus, and I, stack, I squash those together to produce one image that is fully focused from front to back. But to make it a little bit more interesting, I separate the insect into about 30 different sections, and I photograph each one of those sections like a small still life. So, for example, the eye of a fly will have a completely different lighting setup to that of a wing because of the different shape, opacity, and texture, and so on. So once I cover the entire body of the insect in this way, I end up with 30 sections that are beautifully lit and fully focused, so the final image retains all that microscopic detail. But my latest project, though, takes that level of complexity up to the next level. You see, for the last two years, I've been collecting amber inclusions. Now, these are insects and flora that have been encapsulated within hardened tree resin for millions of years. Now, the specimens, they're, they're quite small. They're about three millimeters in length, which is small in photographic terms. But it's actually the effect that the amber has on light, which is the biggest challenge. You see, light wants to travel in a straight line. And it will do so until it reaches a substance of a differing density, at which point it will bend or scatter. And that produces substandard images. So the way I get around this is I suspend that piece of amber in an oil of a similar refractive index. And that allows me to penetrate it with the light in a far straighter path, which gives me more control. And then I can sculpt the light around the specimen, which gives me images of far higher clarity and quality. So after, the first, after a year of testing, experimentation, and more than a few tantrums, I am pleased to share with you the first images from this series. Now, this here is a click beetle. Now, these creatures are still around today, but this particular specimen was walking our planet 50 million years ago. But it's not all insects, though. We've got some plant life here. And what I really love about this image is that you can see those air bubbles. Now, these were created when that amber was still fluid tree resin, and it flowed over that piece of moss. Now, I'm showing you this picture for the completely non-scientific reason of, uh, I think he's cute. I think he's got a great personality. I really do. But the one I want to show you is this. This image here is probably the one I'm most proudest of out of my entire career. And when I saw this image coming together, I realized that these pieces of amber, they really are you know, precious time capsules. And the final artwork had to be presented in a way that was sympathetic to their age. So the final prints for this series, they're created through a process called carbon transfer. And they're exposed via 10 separate negatives. They're the most print, it's the most stable print process possible. And they'll last for 1,000 years and beyond. And the frame itself for these images is also unique. It's made from bog oak. And bog oak is wood from trees that have, been, have fallen, and have been preserved in peat bogs. And this actual wood is carbon dated to 5,300 years old. And it's actually in the first stages of fossilization. But what I love is, if you see on the bottom of that frame, that golden dot, now that is this. So housed within the frame is that piece of amber that contains the specimen itself. And so the viewer has that unique sense of scale. Now, this amber series essentially began millions of years ago before I was around. And the prints will be around for thousands of years after I'm gone. You know, I just feel lucky to have had the opportunity to create them. But mostly, though, I'm, I'm just hugely grateful for my surprise obsession with photographing the microscopic world. I never saw it coming. I really didn't. You know, it's allowed me to study our planet in more detail, and I look forward to seeing what it shows me next. Thank you very much for your time.